We'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Mark Coulson, who will delve very specifically into one situation and we'll leave the questions until after Mark's finished, um, just before coffee. Um, so just to start, I'd just like to acknowledge a few uh, co-authors on this, uh, Bob Lawton and Brian Shaw, the, the previous and current uh, SPAY head biologists, uh, Anya Armstrong, who was with us at RAS and collected most of the data, and of course Eric, who set up much of this work. Um, and in addition, the, the SPAE Foundation and Research Board, Roger, um, and, and as well, the whole hatchery team, mostly uh, Jimmy Woods and Duncan McPherson, who also uh, entertained us for a day as lab rats and allowed us to go into the hatchery, strip some fish, and I think we provided a bit of comic relief for them. Um, and then our now departed director from RAFS, Callum Sinclair, who helped to set this all up. Uh, and where I'm currently based out of Marine Scotland Science, the Freshwater Lab, who've been partners in a lot of this work. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much. We've, there's been a lot of talk already about why stock and different reasons for stocking. Um, and in this book, I'm sure a few of you have come across. Um, there's a, a chapter there by Tom Cross and colleagues all about hatcheries and stocking. Um, and really what I'd like to draw attention to was the, the, one of the recommendations was this idea of getting a genetic profile or genotyping all your brood stock. Uh, and they pointed at, at least two things that that would allow you to do. One is identify, identification of siblings so that you can avoid certain pairings and not make close relatives. That's not really what we're going to talk about today. But the, the one we're really looking at today is then this idea of it allows you to evaluate your, your efficacy or your success of stocking. So uh, this is the River Spey in this part of Scotland here. And this is a better shot of it with its salmon distribution. Um, Roger Knight's going to speak a little bit later on about sort of the management implications and more about the river itself. So I'm not going to get too much into that, um, other than to say that the, the stocking strategy or the stock enhancement policy was initiated in 2003. Um, and it was really to target underpopulated areas um, or above man-made obstacles. Um, and things of that nature. Uh, capacity was initially around two and a half million um, and then scaled back a few years after it, 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 it was initiated to about 1.2 million. And one of the things, be, because they were doing this without very much genetic knowledge at the time uh, on their system, one of the things they did to try to reduce any of these impacts we've been hearing about with Phil and Eric and others um, was to collect brood fish from the location or as near to the location as possible from where they were going to stock back out. So trying to maintain any sort of within river genetic uh, local adaptation and, and minimize any disruption that might have by moving fish over large parts of the catchment. And so just taken from one of their uh, annual reports, therefore their, their aim was to boost the natural smolt output from the spay and hence adult returns and in turn then extra fish may be caught to the, in the rod itself. And that was really the focus of, of why the hatchery was running and why, or the, the question we're really trying to address here with the genetics work. Um, so it's just the overview of, of their hatchery operation. So collecting brood stock from particular source locations, stripping them in the hatchery, um, and rearing them to mostly, they were released as fed fry. I'll show a few numbers on that in a minute. And then planting them back out. Um, as close to the, the sample location from the broodstock as possible. This stage is what I really kind of want to focus on for a minute here, is that in addition to bringing them into the hatchery, they kept very uh, detailed breeding records as to whom was paired with whom. Uh, most of them were single pair matings, but there were cases where female or male was used across multiple, multiple spawning events. And so we have a very detailed record for most of the fish brought through the hatchery over these years as to exactly what fish is compared or was mated with what other fish. And that proves to be incredibly useful when we begin to look at, at the genetic results. Um, I don't know how well people can see this, but this is just uh, from 2004 to 2012, um, a map of where the stocking was, where, where fish were planted out. So uh, if you can see the, the sort of red lines scattered throughout the system, that's where areas that were targeted for stocking. Um, and really, this is just to emphasize the point that the brood stock there for, that were collected from these areas were really scattered throughout the system. It wasn't focused on particularly upper catchments that may be more spring run fish or so on. 
So the, the, the brood stock collected and brought into the hatchery really, I think, represented a nice, the sort of the width and breadth of the de genetic diversity and, and sort of life history diversity um, of fish within the spay. This is just a, an overview there for, then on the uh, hatcher, or the stocking summary by life stage. So you can see most fish stocked out over the years as fed fry. There were some Idova unfed fry, and even in later years, some uh, autumn par. And then you can see sort of the hatchery capacity, which I alluded to earlier on, where initially had a little over 2 million um, fish reared in the hatchery and released. Um, that scaled that back down. And then in the last few years, scaled back dramatically, in part as a result of, of the preliminary results from this work. So the stocking right now has become a bit more targeted and focused in particular areas. And I think Roger will get into that a little bit more later this afternoon. <coughs> This is then just uh, an overview of showing the distribution of the rod catch across all the years, so, and the relative abundance. Uh, there's the location of the two hatcheries that had been operating. Um, and I'm gonna come back later on to Spay Dam, which is located in the upper part of the catchment here. And we had a sample of some uh, fish caught in an adult trap right at the base of the dam. And so gi given the, the low population densities above the dam, it was of particular interest to see if any of these fish returning to just below the dam were from the stocking program, because this was an area of quite intense stocking. Um, and so were any of those adult returns trying to get back above, above the dam. So the really, I think, on the surface of it, quite a simple question is, what proportion then of all these rod-caught fish can we trace back to the hatchery? And that's, that's what the focus of this work is about. Um, and so, of course, for this, we're gonna use, we're gonna use DNA. We've heard a lot of talk about using DNA to identify different stocks and populations. I'm sure as most people, or if not all people in the room know, um, it can use, be used quite powerfully and effectively to identify particular individuals. So we all know shows like CSI, uh, it's perhaps not as fancy and we don't work at the lightning speed that they work and we actually have to go home and change our clothes and come back the next day to get results. Um, but we all know of cases of forensics, um, cases of human paternity, um, so you can, you, you know, you can identify who's the potential father and things like that. Um, so we're, we're aware of these, these sorts of applications. We know that each individual carries a unique genetic fingerprint, um, and that's what we're basically doing with the SPAY results. Um, <coughs> it's a little bit, I guess, different than cases of human paternity, because we're not actually doing paternity, we're doing parentage. Um, and so it actually makes quite a big difference and it makes it a bit harder because if you think of human paternity, we generally know the mother, the offspring, and who's the potential father. Here we're we don't know any of the relationships. We've got a pool of potential mothers, pool of potential fathers, and a pool of potential offspring. We're trying to kind of put all three of those pieces together rather than just fit in the, that third missing piece. Um, so parentage assignment, this is just, just the schematic looking at a single genetic marker. As we've heard already, Every individual inherits a copy from mom, a copy from dad, and so you would expect that any potential parent at any given marker should share at least one of those two variants with their offspring. So if we look here, these are just bits of DNA of different sizes that get separated out through an electric current, and these represent the different variants at that marker. So here's our offspring. They have this upper variant here shown in red, the lower variant shown in blue, and then we have some potential parents we're trying to identify. And as you can see, some individuals, such as parent two, they don't share either variant with that offspring, so they can very easily be ruled out as being a parent. Whereas other parents, parent four shares that variant, it's the only parent to share that variant with that offspring. So that's a pretty strong case, for instance, that they must be related, and likewise parent six that could have provided this variant as well. Of course, doing that with one marker doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. The other thing to keep in mind is, is the frequency of those variants. So if a particular variant at a, at a marker has an 80% frequency, let's say, the odds of me having it and any one of you in the room sharing it are quite high, 60 some odd percent. So it doesn't mean we're related, at least I hope not, other than, otherwise I don't know who mom and dad back in Canada really are. But you start to apply this across a number of different markers and combine all that information. And you don't need a whole lot. In this case, we use 17. Um, and even with what's such a small proportion of the whole genome, you can really get rid or exclude most parents as being very unlikely quite easily. So basically what we're doing is we're taking our rod caught, 
we've got a, a pool of them trying to assign any of the broodstock males and any of the broodstock females to those individual fish. We've got the hatchery breeding records, but we, d we don't use those initially. Those were sorted out by folks at the SPAY and um, another employee, and I did the analysis without any knowledge of, of those breeding records. So sort of doing it blindly like that, and then for any matches we get, we can confirm with the breeding records. The data set, um, we can work in different errors. These are the different markers. You don't have to worry about the names or anything. But this just shows you the number of variants at each marker. So some are quite low. Lots of individuals are just going to share those variants by, by chance. Um, others, you get quite a number, quite a high number of variants, 66 in that case. Um, and there is an inherent error rate in, in, in getting that genetic profile, but that can be worked into the models to take account for, for those sorts of things. Um, so in total, we screened just over 4,100 salmon. We had a few cases of individuals that had the exact same genetic makeup, so perhaps a fish was, the fin clip was put into two different tubes or something got mislabeled. There's always going to be some small amount of, of, of sort of human error right there. So that left us then with 4,155 distinct profiles, genetic profiles, and we removed just under 3% of those individuals because they had, we, we set a threshold to say you have to have at least X percent of a complete profile in order to be included. Because if you introduce individuals that have a lot of missing information for some of those markers, that can really complicate the process. So in total, we had 4,041 individuals for analysis. And as I said, we had the breeding records for most of the fish, but there were a few cases where the, the, who they got crossed with was, was not recorded, so it was an unknown. But we do know that they got used in the hatchery, so they were still included in the analysis because they could still have, have been a, a, a parent. That's just a, a summary of then the, uh, the rod catch from 2007 on, the brood stock used in the hatchery from 2004 on, um, and because we didn't expect in the rod catcher in 2007, any of the earliest broodstock used to have actually produced offspring to return at that point. We just focused on uh, 2008 to 2012. So looking to see our, what proportion of these rod caught fish can be traced back to the hatchery. What we also did sort of out of interest sake um, was to take broodstock from these later years and actually see if any of them are also offspring from broodstock of the earlier years, given that sampling was generally occurring more or less at the same locations to collect broodstock year upon year, it's likely that some of these broodstock could be offspring themselves from the hatchery program. So we had then a total of 1,090 rod caught fish to assess to see if any of them are from the hatchery, uh, 868 for uh, broodstock, and so we had in total 1,958 possible offspring. And just to summarize that, the results then sort of uh, with the schematic here, there's our total number of possible offspring, 1,931 of them, all the parents in this analysis or in this, could be excluded. Um, so n that many fish were not of hatchery origin. We had a small number of cases where we had one parent, either the mother or the father identified uh, from a hatchery fish. I'll come back to those in a minute. And then we had 17 cases where both parents from the hatchery were identified. Um, and we can do sort of some simulations and other analyses to figure out how, how good we are at getting it right. So you can create, in, with computer simulations, different family groups. And we find that even with, we don't even need anywhere near all 17 markers, we can use seven of them and get over 98% accuracy to family groups and so on. So here's, you don't have to take really all of this in. These are the 17 cases where both parents from the hatchery were identified, so you've got an offspring where they were caught, uh, and then the mother identified, father identified where, where they were caught. And so you can see in all cases they were caught in the same year, they were in the hatchery at the same time, that's a good start, uh, from the same area generally. And then once we get these matches, we can look to see were those two individuals actually crossing the hatchery. And you can see in 16 of the 17 cases, it can, was confirmed with the breeding records independently. So pretty, pretty good. Um, corroboration there. There was one case where both these individuals identified um, the cross history was not known for either one of them, 
Um, so this is still then considered consistent with, with this being a, a, a true sort of family group here as well. So that's just the summary then of out by year of the rod catch that was um, attributed back to the hatchery. And so you can see it sort of varies between zero and just under 2% for any given year. So between zero and 2% of fish coming back to the rod in any given year can be traced back to the hatchery. And sort of similar type numbers separated. Just these sort of the, the latter years we used the broodstock to look at that too. And you in fact get one year in 2009, you get a bit higher. Um, also, the, the spay dam individuals, um, we had a sample of 33, as I mentioned, that came back to just below the dam, and none of them could be traced back to the hatchery either. Um, as I said, we had a few cases of where either a single parent was identified from the hatchery. Uh, in most of those cases, I think it's seven out of the ten, it was the, it was the male parent identified, and the other three was the female identified. Um, and in some of the cases, at you know, first glance, um, some of them seem quite unlikely. You know, here's, here's a, an offspring caught in 2009. Its parent was in the hatchery just the year before. Doesn't really seem to make sense at first. Um, but you consider the possibility that we could have been sampling other things in, in the life cycle or other spawning events in the life cycle. Um, so in all these cases, when we only got one individual identified or one parent identified, the obvious the obvious first step is to say, well, was the other mate, or who it was mated with, were they excluded by some of these, these other things I mentioned, you know, kicking out individuals that didn't have a complete profile, et cetera. And in all these cases, no, that's not the case. They were actually in the data set. They were there. They could have been selected. Um, and so I looked at them by eye just to make sure that the analysis just didn't miss it. And, and they were completely poor matches. They were just random with those offspring. So we it can be very confident that the missing parent it's in the data set, but it's, it's not the true mother or the true father, depending on the scenario. But it's possible then, we've got a few other possible explanations that could explain that. So it's possible that for some of these instances, um, if an individual, if a broodstock fish, perhaps it, it matured as a precocious par, sired an offspring, later in its life cycle it went to sea, came back, it was sampled as a broodstock fish, brought into the hatchery then, and what we've sampled as its offspring is not anything from when it was in the hatchery, but from its previous spawning event in the wild as a, as a precocious par, or maybe a repeat spawner, or so on. The point really I'm just trying to make here is that there are other potential explanations for some of these, what may seem at first sort of aberrant results sort of thing. Um, we can't in any one of these situations really say what the likelihood of that explanation versus another explanation is. Um, but we, the thing to keep in mind is we are out of about 2,000 offspring that we sampled, we are talking about only 10 of them. So much, you know, less than 1% of the data set sort of falls into this category. Um, so that's just the, the overview there then of those one parent uh, cases there. I've sort of mentioned a bit, a bit of this already. Um, other potential explanations. The other thing is, even if it's none of these, there is just going to be an inherent small error rate. Um, you can see that in other studies of a similar nature in other species, and it's well within those ranges. Um, the other thing is sometimes an individual could be identified as a mother or father if they are a close relative and the true mother or father hasn't been sampled. So for instance, maybe rather than it being the father, it's the uncle of the offspring, and it's possible to get sort of um, those close relationships actually competing for uh, actual parentage assignments. Um, sort of have already mentioned this, Spay Dam, we had 33 adults returning to below the dam and none of them could be assigned to the hatchery. Um, this table here, we, we also looked at some juveniles that have been stocked out above the dam and then a couple months later subsequently caught again. Because, and the reason we did this was we thought, what if we don't get any hatchery fish in the rod catch, we need to demonstrate that the technique works and we've got zero because there are zero or, and not because the technique isn't working. Um, so it, this was an area we thought we had a really good chance of catching um, hatchery fish because they'd just been stocked out. It's an area of intense stocking and we could go in and most of the, the fish in that sample could be assigned back to the hatchery and again, always corroborated by the, the hatchery records. Um, 
I think I'll just basically end there then. That's just a bit of a summary of most of the points I've already said. Um, so thank you. Right, we've got uh, 20 minutes for uh, questions. Phil, could you come up uh, and Mark stay up at the front? So I open the uh, floor to questions to both Phil and, and to Mark on their presentations. John? John Gibb? Yeah, many thanks to both of uh, both the speakers for very interesting talks. Um, certainly, I just want to ask a question to Phil on the, <coughs> excuse me on the first uh, presentation, which has got a lot that fishery managers like myself have to consider if you're looking at stocking a river. Of that, there is little doubt whatsoever. But it's just it's actually to David Solomon actually asked a question yesterday, which I'm sort of going to ask the same question, <laughs> but having. So now it's nothing about the Extinction Board exists for. It's, it, 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 I swear it's nothing to do with that. Um, but it is to do with the, with the long-term impacts of stocking, which uh, clearly the first half of your talk looked at. What I'm not quite clear about is, is, is surely all science, for want of a better word, or all models have to be applied in the field. And to go back to a long-term stocking project like the Delphi, which I'm really pleased we're going to hear about later on, but if we look at the wild catch on the Delphi over a number of years against a declining backdrop of marine survival, I'm still not clear why, if these models can be applied to an actual field example, why we're not seeing a decline in the wild catch at Delphi. And I'm just quite interested to know your feeling about that. John, I, I, I'm just asking the prop to talk. I just put on an extra slide. I thought somebody might ask this. Now, this was very hastily put together, so excuse if it's, if it's very rough. It might not. I have no proof, it, but I just, uh, I just thought this, as an example, might try and explain uh, what I thought, you know, trying to interpret what might be going on in Delphi. Now, uh, there's no data to, to back this, you know, there's no genetic analysis or anything else, but I just thought, just as a numbers game, there might be some explanation. So, these figures, I, I didn't get a chance to look at these, but I think it's roughly correct. Uh, Say you put in 50,000 smokes. What do, what do they put? Is it about 50 per annum, 50,000 smokes? It can be higher, I think, in some years. Ken, do you know anything about the Delta? Is it 50 to 80,000 or something smokes per annum? I think we're in, but in the early days. So look, let's just take 50,000. 5% return, that might be too high or too low. I think in one year, definitely there was 5 or 6%. In fact, it's an extraordinarily successful ranching operation, whatever combination of environment factors. So say 5% return, 2,500 adults. And if there's any, if I've, Miscalculated, did you forgive me? It was, it was under the influence, maybe, when these were done. Uh, say 20% rod catch, it could be more, 50% or whatever, but say 20%. So I say that's about uh, 500 fish, and in that are the 70 fish or 100 fish or whatever that David showed us yesterday. So potentially, so you take those fish, so potentially, in terms of the hatchery population, there's about 2,000 potential spawners. And then they have a very good retrieval program on recovering those. But I'm giving it a fairly high score. I'm saying we're, we capture 80% of those fish. So 1,600 of them. And that leaves about 400 hatchery origin fish to spawn in the wild. Now, I, I'm basing that on general experience. I've been in the fisheries game for a long time, doing working hatcheries and working in tanks trying to retrieve fish from wild tanks. Uh, I know in Boris, you know, they come up, fish come up through the traps. We recover quite a lot of them. But some years, so in the past years, 20 to 50 percent of the fish could be of hatchery origin. But even, you know, this will more fish will get up and spawn. Even if you, and I know Delphi is, is physical con you know, configuration, I suppose, allows some capacity to recover a lot of the fish. But I think 80 percent is quite fair. So that leaves 400 fish, plus wild fish, if you want to call them wild fish. So this, so this spawning population of 400, and then they are now contributing, you know, maybe not as efficient, but are as equally efficient, whatever you want to, to progeny. And the progeny go around again, and they turn up in the wild catch then, possibly. So, I wouldn't call those fish, now, and I, you know, this, I'm going to put this out, but it, 
the true definition is of 70 wild fish is really 70 fish with adipose fins. What their genetic background? It could be either pure wild hybrids or pure Johashi origin fish. So I would call them, and I, the reason I, I come, the reason I'm giving this title, I just call them the fair. It's a, they're you know, naturalized. They spawn naturally in the wild. But their genetic background could be of multiple things. The fact that you want to show them you know, you can replace, you know, just as a general, you know, you bring stuff in the hatchery, and then it starts developing. It improves the progeny. And then the fact is this again. And the example of this, why I think this is plausible, I'm, I'm not saying this is correct, but why it's plausible, we've been doing some work on the Shannon. And the Shannon has a massive big hatchery mitigation program, Joe, with the dam. And they stock out every year, Joe, quite a number of fry. I suppose it's very similar to the programs in Scotland and Norway and so uh, elsewhere. And those fish uh, come down through the, the facilities, go to sea and come back. And then we get these fish, and we, the, the lads, in the, they call them wild, the wild fish. So, but they're right, so they're wild, they've got ipos fins. Now, they could be the progeny of natural spawn or the, or the stockfish, and then they go up in the cycle. So what we've been doing the last week, we've been looking at the genetic background of those fish in the Shannon. So where did they come from is the question. Well, and 80, 90% of them are of hatchery origin. There are some wild, so, so original, no, some of what you might say historically from historical scale collections and so on, we've been able to match. But in the majority, the fish originate from the hatchery program. Now, that may not be the situation in Delphi, but I think it is still a plausible explanation for why they would still catch 70, 80% or whatever of fish with adipose fins. Now, I hope they're absolutely totally wild, and it would be you know, this long-term depression. So, in a way, my presentation was about, and I hope that came across, was the potential. I think that's what you were asking, John, you know, was the potential for change. But I am quite convinced now, I don't know whether that happens or not, but I'm quite convinced there's a large body of literature there. And that's what I was trying to review the literature for you and say, like, this is, these are the kind of stories. But to my mind, that is a plausible explanation for what David, David was talking about yesterday. It may or may not be the case, but yeah, I hope is that, is that helping anyway? Yeah, no, thanks. Well, I, I think that's, that's a good explanation. I mean, I, I think from what you're saying, am I right in saying that... Uh, you would, uh, if, if that is what's happening at Delphine, as you said, we don't know that, but it's a plausible explanation, then what you're saying is there's still the risk of should an environmental change take place, then the stock is potentially susceptible to not to be able to adapt to that. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. No, thanks, brother. This is actually something they've been considering. What if we were to stop the hatchery program just for a number of years. And this, we've been asked this, what would happen, this, this thing that is working to an extent, you know, we, you know, these fish come back, they go up, would it, would it, you know, would it start to depress, you know, would you start to get products? So that would be a nice study. In a way, it would nearly be worth, Joe, you, know, you could just control the, somewhere to, you know, to the hatchery fish for a number of years to see, is that residual entity? Now, the other thing is, that raw material, you know, there's nothing to say that you know, natural sex wouldn't work its magic and that would become a very, you know, very robust, productive entity. And uh, this is more the philosophical thing of what we're at. This biodiversity idea, you know, and, uh, it's not to be the purest or, you know, and I think this is what David was struggling with yesterday and he was pitching it out to us to start to think about is, you know, these, these are uni they're unique solutions to life in particular environments, possibly the best, maybe not the best, maybe there are better solutions for living in that environment, but they're unique and evolved. And so this is where this, where the conservation questions, Joe, and the fishing management questions just hit. Joe, like what are we trying to, what, like if you think, I think a better way even to think of it, think of the fisheries example again. Like nothing has stopped us fishing away like hell for the last number of years. And we've all these kind of evolutionary effects as well. And yet we still, we accept that. Joe, we, yes, there's a legitimate catch, so above the surface, deep the surface. And you know, that's, so there's some kind of, that's the kind of question we have to have. But if we then think back on that slide there, or this uh, idea that you know, this portfolio, and I think, the, I, I don't want to be Stephen Tom's thunder, but you know, it seems, and there's good measurements from these projects, that this is important, as you say, John, in a, in a changing environment. 
So say in your own situation, I was just thinking yesterday, that's actually, that was a question I was asking myself, right? That's working quite, but what, you know, what is the legacy to your wild population while this is all going on? Even if it's only a temporary thing. What happens when it stops? What happens when the money dries up? Now these are all, these are outside my gamut, my failure too. These are social, political, economic things, you know, and it's about, and then it's about the competition for the resource itself. You know, who uses the water? You know, who's entitled to use the water? Who's entitled to divert, where's the middle? Who's entitled to divert the Shannon for water for Dublin or for fish? You know, all that. Okay, any, any other questions? Thank you. Paul from Welsh Water. Mark, if I read that table correctly, from all that effort, you were returning one or two fish to the rods each year? One, one to two percent. But in ter terms of total numbers, 19 fish, was it? It was, yeah, it was 17 fish across, across the years. So you can kind of, I mean, I think we've done, I think the Spay have done this too. Um, rod, the rod catch for the Spay in a given year, You'll be showing that this afternoon, so I don't want to steal too yeah. much thunder. But yeah, so one to, upwards, up to two percent of the rod caught fish in any given year were were from the hatchery. I was just wondering if anybody's done any estimation of how much each of those fish cost in terms of the. That's later, is it? I think you'll, you'll get. Yeah. I look forward to that one then. Thank you. Okay. In the back there. Um, I'll tell you what, what we found, you know, a number of years ago, we, uh, we conducted uh, when this, when I started education for Ireland, uh, Jamie was talking about it earlier, so the whole national pool where we looked at diverse fishing and then we started signing bar. But in the mouth of the, in the, in the pillory, so there's some local fishers there, we were finding the pool. Ken? I just might be able to add to that. Um, in the context of the Erif, which is the neighbouring system, they've consistently found uh, um, adipose clipped fish, which they assume are from uh, the Delphi. But in collecting brood stock, which they do from time to time for various experiments, they haven't once found an adipose clipped fish during December. So I think that's an important point, exactly what Phil was saying, that even though you may get some of the strays, they haven't actually recorded any at spawning time. I think that's an important one. David. Although the hatchery program has continued, I'm sorry, although the hatchery program has continued, you try and stop all hatchery fish from fishing spawn, and that effectively is going to stop the program. And again, it will appear. Stop. 
Another question? Okay. Question, well, it's a question to Mark. Um, looking at the small releases that were put into the spay um, and the returns that you got from them, one to two percent of rod catch, what were the estimations of the small releases in, in respect of the total uh, small output from the river? Yeah, I might have to defer to the spay folk on that one. Are you saying they matched the returning rod caught fish as a proportion of of the uh, output from the actual? Mm. Uh, Alan Kettlewhite, question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Phil, just a point of clarification, really, is to do with the recovery in the Burishaw wild stock. I take it, as I understand from your papers, that you're able to remove pretty much all the small uh, re ranched fish as they come back in, so they weren't breeding with wild fish? No. Right, okay. Oh, now, we know, from a management point of view, there are a small number we estimate maybe 10, 20 a year. As you know, anybody that manages hatcheries, you don't like to hold fish a long time. Mm. So what they do, just as a precautionary approach, sometimes the runs are late or early or whatever, they allow a number up in the hope that they're homing back and recover them. But they don't catch them all, they, they, they probably recover 80% of them. So every year there might be a little trickle in there of 10, 20 fish or whatever. So what I'm trying to get That's is... since 97. Yeah. So the recovery we see in the wild population there you could expect different if it was just a kind of laissez-faire, let the small ranch oh. fish get on with it with the wild fish. You yes. can't get, it would be a, a different... Or oh, a different scenario. Different scenario yeah. altogether. And maybe some of the management things, Joe, is that you can, you know, in certain places, they may be able to recover the fish. So, you know, a lot of the big hydro stations, so they do recover a lot of the hatchery produced fish. You know, like Borough they can recover all the fish. But that was just a policy change. You know, they said, right, okay, we think this is, could be a problem, and we have the capacity to remove those fish. Um, a question again for, for Phil. Uh, Phil, uh, as a fishery manager, um, when we process a lot of applications um, for development, we often quote the concept of the precautionary principle. And I would like to hear your very clear and concise view. <laughs> phrased, <laughs> phrased in the concept of the precautionary principle on two things. On one, the development of offshore fish farms and the potential for escapees. And two, on having a hatchery to support an existing um, population of Atlantic salmon. Joe, give me that again. No, just, you, what you're asking me is, give me your fish farms. You're talking about yeah, the fri, development of fish farms. No, no, Freshwater. Fri, 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 phrased, let's do it in two, two yeah, ways. Yeah. Phrased in the, in, in, in the precautionary principle. Yes. If you were processing an application for a new hatchery to support an existing population of Atlantic salmon, that was borderline in terms of its conservation limit. Right. Given your own 
conservation, yeah, conservation limit. limit. Given your own um, expertise, I would like to hear how you would phrase succinctly the, the, an, an application of that, that type. <laughs> Have you got one of these applications? <laughs> I haven't actually, no. <laughs> Well, I'd hope I'd given you enough information today that you'd make that decision yourself. <laughs> Sorry, John. I, I, you're, you're. I, let, let's, we'll get... I, uh, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> no, I, I, I think for, just for the, for the purposes of today in this well, conference, I'd like to hear just, you know, often... You know, what I would say, I'd, well, this is what I would articulate is a lot of what we've been talking about. You know, the risk. So you want to know the facts, of, but you are taking a risk of undermining the very thing that you're trying to protect. And that's the way I would put it. You, in the end, John, you're the fishery manager. Let's say our relationship, I'm trying to advise you. I've advised you on the possible implications. But at the end of the day, it is a socio-economic management question. And in fact, that I think is going to be part of our discussion as we move on today is to say, you know, how valuable do you think these resources are? Is it worth, are you worth you know, taking that chance for whatever other objective? Now, I thought the question you were going to ask me is in relation to the conservation limit. And as Ken pointed out, that's a lot of fish. So you know, say it will take up a thousand spawner mm -hmm. and they're at 900. Like I would, be think, I would be advising very strongly not to do it if say it was five. I would say, well, why, you know, you, the potential is there itself to do the business. To get their productivity. So the question then I would ask is, what is, the st what, you know, what is causing that to be below? Are you overfishing it? Might be a simple one that could be redressed. Right is there a pollution problem? Address the pollution. So I would have a five or six things that I would do before I'd ever consider having to. And if, if my story is correct, I am saying that the very thing that you would be doing would be an additional stressor to that population. Is that but okay? Extrapolate that then to... The same principle where we're talking about yep. the potential genetic effect from yes. escapees from fish farms yes. and the proposed um, imaginary yes. development yes, of a very right. large fish farm and its potential for escapees yes. Yes. And, and an effect on a natural population. Yes, I would say, I would be saying, you know, you're, you're loading the gun here. But they're not a problem until they get out, but you've loaded the gun. On the basis of the broader precautionary principle, then would you object? Oh, well, that wouldn't be for me to say. <laughs> no, but you have to, the relationship between the advisor and the manager is to, you know, my job is to advise. I wouldn't undermine my position to advise. Well, just, as we're talking about imaginary things, let's... No, but no, but no, but... Talking about imaginary things... No, but no, work back. So, why, are you, why do you want to develop this fresh farm? Why do you might say, right, there are... I don't know, John came up with some good statistics, you know, how many jobs, equivalents, you know. So, as a society, in the foil or some other imaginary place, these are, the, <laughs> these are the kind of decisions you would have to make. You know, what is the value? Do you value this legacy, this resource, this uh, salmon entity that in perpetuity could produce over a long period X millions of fish? Are you prepared to put that at risk? in order to develop this other industry, valuable industry, with all the spin-off industries and so on. So, in reality, I think you know the answer to the question yourself. That's, you know, that's, the, that's, the, kind of, that's, that's the kind of political, local political kind of question that you want to ask. I would be advising that in order to maintain the potentiality of that resource, that that mightn't be such a good idea. But if I was the fish farmer, I would say, well, I am absolutely guaranteeing you, John, that none of these fish will escape. Well, there's no problem. There's only a problem when they escape. But, you know, you know yourself. Okay, one more question and then we'll convene for coffee. Uh. I'd just like to extend that precautionary principle approach. It strikes me that we're very close now to be able to quantify the genetic risk, of, you know, this dilution of fitness. If we apply precautionary principle, should we be allowing stocking on Sac Rivers, Natura 2000 sites? Should we apply that precautionary principle and say, no stocking on Natura sites? But it, I think it's back to what Dave was, his four points or five points at the start. What is your management objective? What is the objective of an SAC or a, a mature site? Is it, is it the protection, conservation of a resource? Well then, absolutely. If it's 
you know, to supplement the productivity of that in terms of yield to an angling organisation or a commercial fishery, well, then it's something different. You know what I'm getting? I'm, not, I'm For, trying to yeah. be evasive. What I'm really saying is, it's about defining what the objective of the exercise is. I think the objectives of SAC sites are very clear. You know, uh, they, they are simply there for, you know, their biodiversity value. Well, then that would be the, that sounds like the